um, both this past summer's uh, writing grant award and we're making up for last year's cancellations when we had to cancel uh, due to pandemic quarantine. In any case, Nick Walters will present the results of his grant on March 29th, and you can find out more about this event and all of our programming on our website and in our newsletter. We'll post the call for proposals for this year's Summer Writing Grant Awards later this week, so keep an eye out for that uh, faculty. The Summer Writing Grant, along with all of our programming, is made possible by a generous grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And I must add that all of our programming is unthinkable without the support of Associate Director Amy Metham and Administrative Assistant Kimberly Schull. So thanks to both of them. So I'm going to turn it on over to Barry, who's going to share his screen, and we'll he'll talk for about 40 minutes. Barry, take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Dean. Uh, so first of all, thank you, Dean and Amy and Kimberly, um, for all of your support and um, help to me over not just this project, but going back for so long now. Um, you know, I've uh, been at Wake Forest since 2016 and have really benefited from the, the generosity of the Humanities Institute from the intellectual stimulation I received there. Um, I've participated in a faculty seminar on the undercommons that was really transformative for me and so much of my, my thinking. This summer writing grant, a recent book development grant, I've appreciated the, the partnership with Jewish studies that we, we formed. So I'm really grateful. You've even helped fund my students go to Central Europe on a study abroad trip that I led a couple of years ago. So um, it's really felt like a home for me at, at Wake Forest and I'm grateful for that. Um, I also remember scheduling this talk with, with Amy back in September and thinking, oh, maybe this will be in person because like maybe it'll all be over by then. And it seemed like possible back in September to imagine that. Um, and I'm sorry, that's not the case. I'm sorry, I don't get to thank you in person uh, for, for all of, of your support. I also wanna note that I realized that Women's History Month starts today and the book project that I'm going to talk about has a near complete absence of women who are participants in it. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that. And I don't contend with that question directly in the work, um, but I'm also happy to talk about my strategies for sort of uh, dealing with that fact um, during the Q&A if that's of interest to folks. So I'll share my screen here. Um, and please let me know if I've done this correctly. And then it always messes up my screen when I do that. So forgive me for a second for shifting things around a little bit. Um, but now are you able to see my, my PowerPoint? Yeah, Dean, great, thank you. Um, so um, th this work is, uh, um, it's my third book that, that I'm pretty close to, to finishing, um, but it's one that I started some 15 years ago while I was finishing my first book project. And that book was on the origins of modern Yiddish intellectual culture and really the, how did the field of Yiddish studies come into being? And, I located it as one of the consequences of the failed 1905 re uh, revolution in Russia. And this book that I'm uh, gonna be talking about today is really about the end of that project. Um, so it's, it's actually the, the same, many of the same figures appear in both works. And I'm looking at sort of the, their first uh, attempts to bring about a, a modern Yiddish culture and um, their attempts to sort of give it what was called in a different context sort of a decent burial. So uh, my project for this was, it really was to have been kind of a one-off essay in a journal that was dedicated to uh, Jewish encyclopedias that had been invited to contribute to. But as soon as I began sort of reaching into this history, I found the story so compelling that I, I just knew that it needed to be told. And I came to understand over the course of writing this project that this Yiddish language encyclopedia is a way for us to chart the, the displacement of Yiddish, hence the, the title of my project, and the many attached political and cultural ideologies um, that are associated with it. Um, and and it's, it's the language's uh, displacement, not only from Eastern Europe in the Holocaust, but also the fact of, of, of its uh, displacement uh, from Jewish, the Jewish intellectual life. You know, we don't think in Yiddish um, any longer. We don't write in Yiddish. Very few people speak in, in the Yiddish language. And what that means is that masses and masses of books, many of them are on my shelf. I'm not sure which way to show my camera. Like, you know, just can't be accessed by, by so many uh, people because the language just is not um, considered uh, to, to be really be at the, the, the center of Jewish life any longer. 
I'll just say there's enormous challenges in doing this kind of work that I didn't expect at the outset. Not only are the volumes themselves very hard to get, especially the first editions, but as I came to discover, the archives and periodicals associated with it are scattered all over the world. And they're in New York and in Boston and Montreal, Paris, Amsterdam, Jerusalem, Cape Town. And the materials also appear in you know, some half a dozen languages. And I had to figure out how to work with Yiddish and Hebrew and German, Russian, French, um, as well as some, some in English, which were less hard to deal with happily. Um, but then also this project took me to Weimar, Germany. It took me to interwar France and then to the immediate post-war period in the United States and got me and, and really forced me to kind of immerse myself in those historical periods and reminded me of something that happened in my job interview here at Wake uh, when I was asked what sort of historian I was. You know, was I an Americanist or was I a Germanist or a Russianist? And I actually hadn't been asked that question before. And I thought, you know, well, we go where the Jews go. It's like, you know, you, we just have to follow the people that we study and they don't, they don't stay in one, in one place. Um, so in terms of uh, the, this uh, uh, material, you know, when we, when we think about encyclopedias, right, we, um, what, we, what is commonplace, I think, about our understanding of them is there's a presumption of reliability, of consistency of the works, there's something that is reassuring, I think, to many of us about the uniformity of the volumes. We can imagine that there may be sort of a central plan, there's a guiding vision, and very often, as in the case of this encyclopedia, this is a Jewish encyclopedia from the early 20th century, uh, that there's often a single editor who shepherds the project from beginning to completion. Encyclopedias cover an established and defined body of knowledge, and they have usually a clear beginning and a clear end. Now, to be frank, some of the very first modern encyclopedias were these massively unwieldy projects, such as uh, uh, Diderot's Encyclopedia in French, which in its second uh, uh, sort of second edition went to 166 volumes. We have uh, Ersch and Gruber's Algame Encyclopedia, uh, which went to 167 volumes. These are works that sought to contain all of the knowledge of the world between their pages, at least they presumed, um, sort of all, all the knowledge that was fit to contain. What happens though is that by the early 20th century, the, the form of encyclopedias begins to shift and it shifts sort of in two ways that are probably worth mentioning here. One is that it becomes uh, explicitly tied to national programs. Sort of each nation must have an encyclopedia of their own in their own language in order to sort of announce themselves to the world. And at the same time, because of innovations, technological innovations, printing innovations, the form becomes much more standardized and they become produced for mass reading audiences. So it's no longer uh, an esoteric subject that just very few people could afford, but something that certainly every sort of good bourgeois or middle-class home should have on their shelves. Um, and so, if this is how we think about encyclopedias, the project that I'm talking about, sort of by contrast, is uh, an encyclopedia that is defined, if by anything, by its complete incoherence. It's defined by instability and its ever-changing mission, which occurred on account of the rise of Nazism to power, the continual displacement of Yiddish-speaking intellectuals, artists, and activists, and, and speakers as a whole, from their historic centers in Eastern Europe, as well as by the changes in the, both the functional and symbolic role of the Yiddish language. So if you can see this picture of the encyclopedia that I have here, this is what a complete set looks like of the encyclopedia. This is one uh, that I, uh, this is a picture that I took on my bookshelf a couple of days ago, where I sort of lined them all up sort of as neatly as I could with these. And I'll just kind of walk you through what these encyclopedias are. So Yiddish we read uh, from right to left, uh, it's written in the Hebrew alphabet. And these first volumes here, the, the first four of them were published in Paris, uh, starting in 1934. Um, this last one um, uh, here was published in 1937, so every few years. And then it actually skips, and then these, it skips one volume, and then these next two volumes were also published in, in Paris. The one in the middle uh, was published in New York during World War II. Now, the one that's in a box here is one of very few volumes or yeah volumes of this uh, uh encyclopedia that exist in the world the vast majority of them were lost at sea it was published weeks before the nazis invaded paris 
the bulk of the shipment was, was sent to the United States where presumably that ship was sunk by a U-boat. But a few volumes made their way through the regular mail and survived. And I was able to find one for $5 in a used bookstore, which was very exciting for me. Then the subsequent volumes were all published um, in the United States after the war, including these ones here, which were published in the middle of the 1960s, which as you can tell by sort of how neat and tidy they are, uh, were largely unread and um, there's no audience for them. At the same time in the post-war period, you have a four volume English set that was published of the encyclopedia, which was an attempt to take the, 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 the sort of the best articles of the Yiddish and translate them for a Hebrew reading audience. So I'm gonna talk a little bit just about this history with you, kind of give you a sense of it. Um, as a way to start, I'd like to sort of just talk about the, the state of Yiddish um, in the, the 1920s, 1930s when this project began. So uh, already by the 1920s and early 30s when people are beginning to advocate on behalf of the Yiddish encyclopedia saying, you know, Yiddish speaking Jews need an encyclopedia of their own. Yiddish is already what we might think of as a transnational language. You know, there's a historic center of the Yiddish language, probably now and what, or at this point in what we think of as the lands of Poland or parts of the Soviet Union. But it's really all of these territories of Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, um, parts of Poland, you know, that are tied to, to the Ukraine as well. These are the historic homes of Yiddish. But by this time period, there had been such displacement and migration of Yiddish speaking Jews that there are many other sort of smaller important centers and these include Berlin, Germany, they include New York City, Paris, others in Melbourne and in Cape Town in Buenos Aires. And so you have these peripheral sites which become absolutely vital to sustain the language um, after World War II. If there's any sort of home for Yiddish intellectual culture in this time period, it's with uh, uh, an organization known as YIVO, the Yiddish Scientific Institute, which was formed, in, it was actually founded in Berlin, but the building gets established in Vilna, Poland, which was then part of Poland. Today, it's the capital of Lithuania, Vilnius. And it's established in 1925. Um, and it really becomes the closest thing we have is to sort of a center for Yiddish um, culture. Now, what makes um, this project that I'm uh, sort of looking at sort of stand out from nearly every other intellectual venture that happened in uh, the Yiddish culture is that it's the only one that's able to continue through World War II um, and the Nazi Holocaust and then uh, main, be maintained um, in, uh, in the post-war period, you know, for several decades. Really, the only other project is that of YIVO itself. You know, every other project comes to an end with the beginning of World War II. And so we often think of these, this period, not surprisingly, in terms of Jewish history, as one that's simply defined by rupture, right? We, we know classes in Jewish studies often end in 1939, and then there's classes on the Holocaust, and they pick up um, after, uh, after the war. And so one of the things I find so compelling about this project is that it represents one of those few chains of continuity that link the, the pre-modern uh, European world to the post-modern American world. So early in the 20th century um, was a time when there was a whole number of Jewish encyclopedias that were published. So this is hardly the first one. Interestingly, and for, for reasons I could go on, sort of ad nauseum about, um, they all appear in non-Jewish languages. So the first of, of them is the Jewish Encyclopedia, which I showed you as one of my first slides, which appeared in New York in 1901. And then there's a Russian variant of it and uh, that, that happens almost immediately after. It's published out of St. Petersburg. And then in the 1920s, there's actually two, but there's, this is the more famous of the ones that are published in Berlin, Germany. Now what makes these encyclopedias sort of interesting in a way is that they're all Jewish encyclopedias. So that, what by, and by what I mean by that is that they are focused on uh, entries dedicated to Jewish content. So important Jewish historical figures, Jewish religious concepts, um, important moments in Jewish history, important cities, um, Jewish political movements, cultural movements, labor movements. So they're very much about uh, 
conveying the, the total of Jewish civilization as its founders sort of understood it. But by virtue of the fact that they appear in non-Jewish languages, it assumes a, a, an audience of both Jewish and non-Jewish readers, right? And so with each of these three projects, there's, the, there's sort of this dual mission in a way. There's a goal to present Jewish people as compatible with the societies in which they're located. So locating you know, uh, Jews in America as part of uh, as being Americans, Jews in Russia as Russians, Jews and Germans as Germans. But at the same time, they're working in the opposite direction and that they're trying to bring Jewish knowledge to Jewish audiences who no longer have the capacity to read Jewish languages. Okay? So they're working in these two directions, which is really quite fascinating. Now for my project, what they're trying to do is they're trying to create a, a, an encyclopedia in the Yiddish language, right? And so this is going to be an encyclopedia that is going to be restricted uh, almost entirely to, to Jewish readers only and to a subset of those Jewish readers, ones who can work in the, the, the Yiddish language. But this constitutes about half of the, the, the Jewish world at the time, some nine to 10 million readers of Yiddish are estimated uh, by the founders. And this was, the, you know, the project that I'm working on was not the first attempt to make an encyclopedia in the Yiddish language. There are many that uh, had been tried in the, the early decades of the 20th century. All of them fell flat for a bunch of reasons, but one of them was there was just a sense that the Yiddish language itself wasn't capable yet of conveying the knowledge of the world in the Yiddish language, that, 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 uh, that the language itself hadn't developed. So that by the time uh, my encyclopedias get together, to, to talk about um, this encyclopedia, you know, they, they were and sort of announcing to, to themselves and to the world that Yiddish had finally arrived as a language, that it was finally ready to join the, the languages of the world and that Yiddish speaking Jews were ready to join the nations of the world. Now, my Yiddishists, my, my figures came together to, uh, in honor of their sort of teacher and mentor, Simon Dubnov, who's the sort of the great historian of um, Eastern European Jewry. He was near, he was in his, as it turns out, in the last decade uh, of his life. Um, and he had uh, spent his entire uh, uh, whole career as a historian, really trying to convey the, the, the history and diversity and development of Eastern European Jews, really to try to uh, show that they really rested at the, the center of European life. Some of these other figures who came together really to honor him include the leader of the Mensheviks who were in exile, Rafael Abramovich, the historian Elias Cherikover, and the statistician and demographer Jakob Lischinski. Now what's interesting is all these figures happened to be living in Berlin, Germany um, at the time period. They themselves had uh, either fled the Soviet Union, such as um, uh, Abramovich, who really fled for his life, and others had just decided to leave Poland in order to take refuge in Berlin um, in order to sort of get away from kind of the, the, the hustle and bustle of Poland, which was a very, very vibrant scene for uh, Yiddish letters, but also hotly contested in terms of political divisions. Um, and so what this group decides to do is they come together and what they want to publish is an encyclopedia in the Yiddish language, but unlike any other of these Jewish encyclopedias, they say, we're going to put together an Algemeine encyclopedia, a general encyclopedia that we don't need to give Jewish knowledge to these Jews because they're already Jewish. They know if they know the Yiddish language, there's an assumption that they're already familiar with most Jewish subjects. But what they need, what we need is knowledge of the larger world. So we are not going to model our encyclopedia on these other works. We're going to model our encyclopedia on Diderot's encyclopedia. We're going to uh, model it on the Encyclopedia Britannica. We're going to bring the knowledge of the world to Jews in order to modernize them, modernize us as a people, and to really provide this guide so that Jews can make their way through the world. Now, this in itself is this very controversial decision. Um, there are many people say, no, uh, Jews are already modernizing. What they need is Jewish knowledge. And they, these groups go back and forth over this issue. Um, the group YIVO, which I, I mentioned earlier, which had sort of prompted this discussion, pulls away from the project and doesn't want to have a formal tie to it. Um, but they insist on, on kind of going together. And what they ultimately decide on is a split, sort of 70% general knowledge, about 30% Jewish knowledge. 
And most of that Jewish knowledge was gonna be in a supplement volume, sort of as a bonus that would be made available to subscribers. They thought it would be about, they thought it'd be a 10 volume project with this 11th volume given at the end, and that it would take about five years to put together. That's obviously not what happened. And this is why it becomes kind of an interesting story. So in um, 1932, they decide to release um, a proba heft. And um, again, this is you know in Yiddish, so you can see that the, the version on the left in the middle says proba heft, but you can see at the bottom it says 1932. So it says, comes out of something called the Dubna Fund in Berlin. And this proba heft, uh, when it's released, is done, it's really just a marketing tool. It's to show to potential subscribers that they should get this issue, that they should get this uh, encyclopedia set. But it is generates so much excitement in the world of Yiddish letters that it generates its own reviews. So there are reviews published in the Yiddish press over this sample volume and, and all sorts of people weigh in. Um, it's absolutely fascinating, but it actually compels them to put out a second version. So you can see this next one is published in 1933, um, just on the eve actually of the Nazis coming to power really within days. And I'll just show you a couple of pictures from the inside. So you can see that it looks like kind of a basic encyclopedia in a way, right? So there's an entry here on obelisk, another one on dinosaurs that's there. Um, it's probably not showing the exact uh, uh, proportional size of dinosaurs to, to locomotives. Um, this is my favorite image, this one here. So this is an image of um, Easter Island, of course. But for any Hebrew readers out there, you can see it actually says Pesach Insel, so Passover Island, um, which I just think is funny. Um, and so you get the sense like this is what was it in the in, in the encyclopedia. And it was a, a very kind of broad sweeping uh, 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 proba heft, this the sample volume that they put forward. But of course, as soon as that uh, second version of the sample volume is released, Hitler comes to power. Now these are Jews, they are foreigners, and they are leftists. So they are triply at risk of being arrested. And some of them actually were, and they were able to escape. Um, and so within a period of, of a few weeks for some and a few months for other, they all flee, they all flee Berlin. And some of them go to Eastern Europe, some of them go to America to, to, to resettle. But the bulk of them end up in Paris, which becomes the home for most German uh, Jews who fled Germany on, on, with the onset of Nazism. And so they're, they're in Paris in 1933, and they have to reconstitute the project. They're now twice as far from Warsaw uh, in Vilna than they were before. And so their, their, their bonds to the, the societies are ever more frayed. Um, they're very well aware of this rising threat of fascism from Europe, but they could recommit to this project. They set up new offices and instead of ha having some materials be bilingual of Yiddish German, it's now Yiddish French and a lot of the language of their, the documents shifts to French at this point. And they begin to you know, reestablish this project and it takes a long time. So the first volume finally that's published doesn't come out until very, very late, like December 31st, 1934, just uh, uh, sort of uh, just uh, under the, the wire. But they put out this volume and it goes from the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, to Atlantic City. And that's what it covers. And this um, generates such excitement in, in the Yiddish world. Uh, this, it contains these, these full color maps, um, which you know, to, to many people had, had never been seen before in, in this sort of volume. Here's one obviously of North America. Um, it begins with this reproduction of a very famous uh, uh, painting by the, the German Jewish artist, uh, uh, Lesser Uri. This is of uh, Jeremiah, which, which is kind of an, an interesting work on its own. Um, and it gets so much attention in the Yiddish world that for one uh, publication, one famous journal, sort of the, the New Yorker of its time, dedicates the entire issue over to celebrating this work. Um, it's not particularly critical, but it's a fascinating just, you know, sort of media push for this work. And for, for many people, it's really a sign that Yiddish you know, as a language ha has come into its own at this moment. But there are funding difficulties. It's really hard for them to get subscribers. It's really hard for them to keep the ties with their different contributors. You know, they're suffering from this is the middle of the depression. People don't have the five dollars that it costs for individual volumes. It's an enormous sum for 
sort of working class Polish Jews. And so it takes them a long time. So the next volume doesn't come out until, I'm sorry, I, that was not the slide I meant to show you, it doesn't come out until 1935. Um, so we have uh, a volume comes out in 1934, in 1935. And then an interesting thing happens in 1936, they put out the third volume and they're still in the first letter of the alphabet. But very curiously at the end of what looks like a regular encyclopedia and without any discussion appears this long essay, multi-author essay on the topic of anti-Semitism. And it's in, it's in the right place alphabetically but otherwise it's completely out of sync with the rest of the encyclopedia. They don't have multi-authored essays in this work. And so that was the first signal that like something's up, that there's some sort of transition happening. The same thing happens in 1937 with the fourth volume. There's a long essay on Eretz Yisrael, so the land of Israel, so Israel-Palestine. Um, it includes again, a full color map. And again, it's in the right place alphabetically but it's out of sync with the rest of the volumes, which are on things like, you know, submarines and uh, X-rays and you know automobiles. Just this very long essay on the land of Israel. Now these are Jews who are not Zionists by and large. They're what we call diaspora nationalists. They believe that Jews have a right to live as full citizens in the societies in which they reside, but to live as Jews in their own language. They, they have the right to their own. Yiddish newspapers, Yiddish language schools, even their own Yiddish governing institutions, but located within the states in which they're already living. So in, in whether it's in Berlin or Paris or, or, or New York or Poland, you know, they're fighting for what they called uh, here-ness, like their ability to be here, as opposed to the Zionist vision, which is to be right there in, in the land of Israel. But this is actually a quite sympathetic reading. Um, of the Zionist movement, which again is kind of another signal because of course by 1937, the situation for Jews in Europe um, is declining tremendously. And then to the point where in 1938, I'm sorry, I skipped again, 1938, things would become catastrophic, right? So the war doesn't start until 1939, but the year before that, there's the Anschluss where Germany seizes Austria there is uh, the taking of the Sudetenland, these Czech territories. And then of course it ends with Kristallnacht. In each of these instances in 1938, the, the, the situation for the Jewish community goes from being difficult and full, you know, full of discrimination and oppression to being really an existential crisis. And it prompts this massive refugee crisis. So in response to this, these crises of 1938, the editors decide they're going to publish the supplement early, that they're going to publish that last volume on Jews sort of in the middle of the project. And so in 1939, they put out a volume that they called Yidden, meaning just Jews. And this is a, a project that is about sort of the, the history of, of the Jews of Europe. It gives them their long history, has articles on Hebrew and Yiddish literature on different aspects of Jewish culture. But what they say is that because of the worsening conditions, we're not gonna do just one of these volumes, we're gonna do two. So we're gonna make this a double volume and that the next one will come out shortly. And it does come out and this is uh, Yidin Bay, so the second of these. And this is the volume that is shipped just on the eve of the Nazi invasion of Western Europe. And this is the one that is lost at sea. The only a few volumes um, survive of it. So, when Germany does invade France, my figures have to flee again. They've already fled from the Soviet Union. They've fled from, from Germany. Now they have to flee from, from France. They make their way to Lisbon ultimately and are among these refugees who are able to get into the United States um, in this period when the war is on, but the United States has not yet joined it. There's hundreds of ships that actually land in the United States, bringing several thousands of people and they are lucky enough to be on these ships. Now, this was the point at which I had, and so I had written all of this history up and I had sent uh, this final, the, so it's in three chapters, this, this book, I'd sent the, the second chapter off to my editor and then COVID struck, right? Um, so it was within days that the lockdown happened and my life got completely overturned and my project got stalled. 
Um, I've written about that elsewhere. I'm happy to kind of share that with you. But this is what my uh, life looked like for the next several months where my, my wife, Jennifer, and I, you know, Jennifer's in the English department here, um, had to turn ourselves into kindergarten teachers and to teach our daughter Spanish. And we did all these things. We found tadpoles that we raised into toads together. We built a coronavirus pinata. We baked so much banana bread. We made a garden. And my daughter spent an entire evening trying to figure out how to spell the F word. Um, and we did not share it to her. She heard another kid say it. She wanted to know how to spell it. And so this is her evidence of it. But it seemed like a good sign of what the virus was. And this is where the Humanities Institute grant came in such handy for me, right? So what that grant did, um, Dean, Kimberly, and Amy, is that it helped buy me some time, bought me some technology, bought me the ability to get archives from uh, collections that are very far away to get them digitally sent. And I am so grateful. And so it was at this point that I turned to the Humanities Institute for the support. And it allowed me to write the last third of this project, um, which was on the New York years. So my figures come to the United States, uh, you know, um, before, the, before the Holocaust begins, right? The Holocaust really begins with a German invasion of the Soviet Union, which happens the following summer. But they're in America and they're trying to now to figure out what to do with their project. Not all of them make it, make it. some are unable to get out. All of them, all of those figures perished in the Holocaust. But they were, what's interesting is that they remain committed to the encyclopedic form. But what becomes very clear to them is that the need for a general encyclopedia in the Yiddish language is rapidly disappearing. And so what they decide initially to do is they're gonna put out a third volume in the, the, the series on Jews and try to recommit to the general volume. Now, what happens over the next 25 years of this project that doesn't end until 1966 is they ultimately just publish one more volume of general knowledge, the, the fifth, but then they publish seven total volumes in the supplement series, the Yidin work, and then a four volume English language work. So the whole project goes through this profound transformation because what they realize in this moment is that you know, the, the needs of Yiddish speakers have just dramatically changed and they've gone through this profound shift. And what Jews need is a, is a guide to the, their own culture. They need a, 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 an archive to this community that has been destroyed. They need memorial books. They need a guide to what life in the Americas will be like. And ultimately what they decide they need is a, a study of the Holocaust itself. And this then becomes their, their work for the, the next several years. Um, so in, in coming to America, you know, they, they put out a series of new volumes and they, they take a, a tremendous amount of time. They put out the third of the Yidden series in 1942. They put out a, 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 a book, uh, Yidden Dalid, so that's the fourth in the series um, in 1950, where they start providing sort of a statistical handbook of, of um, the situation of Jews in, on the eve of the Holocaust. And then they also decide as part of the, the large celebrations that, that took place um, in the mid 1950s to celebrate 300 years of Jewish life in North America, they begin to produce this new series called The Jewish People Past and Present. And again, like the, the main project, this too is faced by interrupts with interruptions and, and changes um, in its content and its mission. They think it's gonna be a one-off. It becomes four volumes altogether. And they, it contains both some of the, the, the best writings from the, the, Yiddish, the Yiddish series that get translated into English. And then later, some new contributions that are written in English get put into later Yiddish versions. So there's kind of this, this multi-direction uh, to the work. They contain works, uh, there's a volume on Jewish life in the Americas that really seeks to, to give the history of uh, the Jew Jewish communities uh, as far north as Canada and as far uh, south as Chile and, and the communities in between. Um, it contains some of the, the first comprehensive histories of the Nazi Holocaust um, as well. And so I'll sort of end on, on, on this point, maybe it's a, a little early, but these, these last two volumes uh, from 1964 and 1966 
uh, were really the, the first comprehensive studies of the Holocaust to appear that were these multi-author kind of survey works. We'd had, there was a few studies of the Holocaust that had emerged, most importantly, Raul Hilberg's Destruction of European Jews. But those works that appeared in English and some in French and German were almost entirely told from the point of view of the perpetrators. The goal of historians like Hilberg and others was to figure out how and why the Nazis committed the genocide that they did. But they largely were dismissive of Jewish sources. So they weren't paying attention to Jewish eyewitness testimonies uh, of memoirs, of diary writings, you know, this whole sort of what we think was ego documents. But these Yiddishists, they saw that the, for them, the real history of the Holocaust was the history that was told from the point of view of the victims and the survivors. Those who, who suffered the indignities of Nazism, who resisted it, who endured it, and who perished in it. So these final two volumes come out in um, 1964 and then 1966. And an interesting thing, when I was first uh, researching this encyclopedia in the year 2008, I called up the offices of a group called uh, the Tsiko, the Central Yiddish Cultural Organization, which then had its offices in New York, just above Union Square. And I called them to ask if they had any files on the encyclopedia, since they were the last sort of official publisher of the work. And I was uh, doing research at the YIVO, which was just a few blocks away from there. And so I called, I get a hold of the, the executive director, who's a, this actor named Hi Cohen, a uh, Hi Wolf, sorry. And he calls me and says, you're calling about the Yiddish encyclopedia? In all my years working here, no one has ever called the encyclopedia. Come on over, my basement is full of them. So I went over to the offices and we, he took me down into the basement and there floor to ceiling were these pristine, beautiful uh, volumes of the last two uh, sets of the encyclopedia on uh, the Holocaust. So these are works that there was just no audience any longer for it. And if you look at the foreword to these last volumes, there's a, a note from the sort of the last managing editor of the project who says, we hope that with these volumes, we bring to the thousands of Yiddish readers a uh, history of the Holocaust. Now, for me, this is just, of course, profoundly sad because at the opening address of Simon Dubnov in 1931, when they gathered together to decide this, he talked about this as a project for the nine to 10 million Yiddish speakers in the world. And so I'll just sort of, or sort of end with, with this point and this, 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 this last slide here that, um, so um, not, and so I'm just gonna read to you, this is uh, from, from my work. So it's notwithstanding the hundreds of Jewish scholars and cultural activists who ultimately collaborated in the making of the Algamena Encyclopedia, and the often dramatic and compelling history of its production, it's been almost entirely overlooked by scholars since its final volume was published in 1966. It's not hard to understand why. This lost treasure of Jewish civilization is written primarily in a language that few readers today can understand. Its archival materials are scattered in more than two dozen collections located on many continents. Complete sets are nearly impossible to obtain. But in spite of the, the chaos that marks the encyclopedia, there's much to be learned about the fate of Yiddish culture from examining its history. Among the goals of my book is to introduce this encyclopedia to contemporary readers, make the case not only that the volumes can serve as a valuable source of information from which to draw, but that they demonstrate how the fate of modern Yiddish culture and its speakers were deeply intertwined with much larger historical forces of geopolitical alignment, the rise of communism and fascism, world war, displacement and genocide. So if Diderot's encyclopedia symbolizes the enlightenment's triumph of reason over superstition and order over chaos, the Algamena encyclopedia by contrast embodies the disorder and irrationality of the enlightenment's demise in the Holocaust. And moreover, I think it symbolizes the tenacity of the, the the, the victims of that disorder and their resolve to continue advocating on behalf of their language and culture. So I'll leave it with that. Thank you. And I'll figure out how to stop sharing my screen here. Gary, that was just really extraordinary. Uh, I've heard bits and pieces of this material over the last two or three years, and I've always been thrilled by the excitement with excitement by your particular findings, but this was the first time I got such a sense of the overall arc of the project, including both the um, anticipated promise of what this was supposed to be, that is the encyclopedia was supposed to be, as well as the uh, all eclipsing tragedy 
of what it turned out to be. So I just really thank you for giving us this, this big story. Um, and I'm so pleased that you're completing this project. This is really thrilling. Thank uh, you. I just want to also say, if I can real quick, sure. um, one of the things that's helping me to finish this project is not only the grant from the summer, but the book development grant that you all offered, hey. which I'm just going to make a pitch for it if I can. <laughs> so the Humanities Institute, if you don't know, I know some of you do, but they offer grants. So when you have a completed manuscript, they will pay to have it sent out to readers. It's extraordinarily hard to get your books read by colleagues who are experts in the field, because who has the time to read an entire book manuscript? But with the incentive of the Humanities Institute, we get to pay these folks. And it worked out so well in my instance that I already had a contract for this book. I got a contract over the summer. Um, it was a great day. It was in the middle of August, I remember, and I signed the contract for this book. And I sent the reader reports to my press. And when they saw who the names were, they said, we will accept these as reader reports. And so it, what that meant was that the press itself is not going to then go out and have to get new reports. They're still gonna read the manuscript and make sure I've done everything it's supposed to. But it's also just sped up my process and probably saved me several months, which in publishing terms means an entire publishing season. So unless something goes wrong in noting the history of this book, it certainly will. You know, hopefully within about a year from now, the, the book will you know, be out, which again is because of this work that you, all, that, that you do. So thank you for that. Thank you for that, Barry. Well, I was gonna say just now that Q&A on Zoom is always an awkward affair, no doubt about it, but here's how <laughs> we'll proceed. If you would like to ask a question or, or make a comment, um, you, there's two options. One is just turn your camera on and kind of wave your hand and I'll try to call on you like we would do if we were all together. However, if you're not comfortable turning on your camera, you can put a, a question in the chat box and I'll identify it that way as well. And you know, bear with me, I'll try to try to catch people as I see them. Most people don't have their cameras on and that's perfectly fine. But if you want to raise a question, um, uh, turn on your camera and we'll, and we'll go. So with that in mind, we have about uh, 15 or so minutes for a Q and A and discussion. Uh, anybody have a question for uh, Barry? Aha, okay, it looks like Fred's got a question. Yes, I have a question. Uh, I have no expertise in this area at all. And I was just wondering what the size of the audience will be for a book, such a book. You know, that is a question. Um, that happily, there's, uh, you know, from publishing point of view, there is this crossover interest, right? So I mean, the, there's a, a a significant body of people who are interested in works on and about the Yiddish language, right? So it has, as I said, you know, it doesn't have the same functional value it used to have, but it has this symbolic value for, for many people. And, um, and also there's great interest in, in the Holocaust. And happily, um, this is not the only work sort of in this genre that um, I've been able to draw from this really broad body of literature that examines not necessarily the, just the intersection of Yiddish culture and the Holocaust, but part of this new work, uh, new sort of line of historical inquiry on Jewish knowledge production. Um, and so I'm hoping there'll be quite a bit of interest. You know, I think the, the story that compels me that I find so compelling about this work, hopefully I've written it well enough that it'll compel others too, so. That's yeah, fascinating, really fascinating. Yes. Um, I see a question from Herb Spindel and then Gail Siegel is after Herb. So you have to turn on your microphone, Herb. All right, I think I did it. <laughs> Barry, um, I do know of Evo and you mentioned it, but for some reason you didn't mention the um, Yiddish, is it the Yiddish bookstore in Amherst, Mass? Uh, and their collection of Yiddish no, I did not, because I was fa founded in the 1990s, you know, sort of long after my project. But I'm actually really grateful to the Book Center because they have digitized um, so many, uh, you know, tens of thousands of Yiddish books, including the sample volume of my encyclopedia, which is where I, because that is almost impossible to find in the library. So I was able to get it from them. Fascinating. And Gail, you had a question. Yes, um, I really loved your presentation. I thought it was fascinating, all the archival work, which is really important. It was kind of a rescue mission in a way. I was wondering, you know, I grew up in New York. My grandparents spoke Yiddish. 
and they read the forewords. And I don't know how many people actually, what kind of readership the forwards had, but it went on for a long time. So <laughs> could you say something about, about that, the Yiddish readership in New York? Yeah, sure. And I'll tell you, there's a new book about the forewords that just came out um, in the fall. <laughs> Um, it was $120, so I would loan you my copy rather than ask you to buy one, um, by one of my teachers, um, Gennady Estreich, um, who's at NYU. Um, yeah, so the Yiddish Forwards at its height had a readership of well over a quarter million daily readers, um, and that would have been in the 1920s. You know, it declined precipitously, and the, the joke by the time I was a student was that it was no longer Yiddish, it was no longer daily, and it was no longer forward, because <laughs> it had become a weekly, they, it was more well known in its English version, and its politics had shifted sort of radically away from its uh, social democratic roots. Um, but certainly in coming to America, um, you know, uh, Yiddish was, it was the language of, of the, the Jews there, and, um, but it was typically only the language of the first generation in terms of a spoken language because the United States was simply more welcoming, right? Um, there weren't the same racial barriers or uh, religious barriers that sort of kept you speaking Yiddish as they, they had in Europe. And uh, there were options and opportunities in America for so many Jews that usually within a generation um, Yiddish was uh, not really continued as a language of day-to-day -day communication, with the exception being uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews, among whom the language even to this day is absolutely sort of thriving. And there remains hundreds of thousands of Yiddish speakers in the world at, who have it as their, their native language. Um, but the sort of the intellectual and political and cultural questions they have are completely disassociated from this. You know, after the World War II, you know, America becomes the home to the greatest number of Yiddish speakers. And there's this intensive wave of, of efforts to continue the language and to try to convince another generation of speakers to take it up and to make it their own. So there's this <laughs> burst of publishing activity, of cultural activity, creative work, some of it good, some of it terrible, sort of the, the whole range. Um, and my, the later volumes of my project, uh, of my encyclopedia in some ways, are, are part of that larger project. But really by the, the mid 1960s, it's kind of lost a lot of steam. And Yiddish as a new, a, another generation of scholars who's just kind of up and coming is starting to sort of understand is that Yiddish takes on more of the symbolic value, right? We can think of Leo Rostin's Joys of Yiddish. We can think of the, the movies of Woody Allen, right? Which begin to appear in the 1960s. Uh, you know, there's all sort of these cultural associations, right? There's Fiddler on the Roof from Broadway and so on. And so people feel as if they have an attachment to Yiddish, but it's rooted sort of in nostalgia and sort of this, this saying Yiddish, this like Hamish Yiddish, right? This hominess of the language. But what it's missing is, is sort of the, the, the full kind of range uh, of possibilities that existed in Yiddish prior to that time period. People talk right. about it calling it, it goes into its po post vernacular period. Gary, can you talk a bit more about just that point and how yeah. the Encyclopedia Project, how its, its editors um, imagine their audience? So if on the one hand, uh, post-war Yiddish is a, you know, not exactly a project, but it's involved in kind of constructing uh, a Jewish past that, that regularizes Jewish culture in the U.S., what in contrast is the project of for on behalf of Jews, uh, for yeah. the editors, how are they imagining their Jewish audience? What are they trying to make them into? Into sure. Their, well, they're they're trying to do two things simultaneously. On the one hand, they're trying to keep the the bonds of the transnational Yiddish community alive. So what happens is because of the war and the Holocaust, Jews are scattered even further. Right. Already before the war, there were these other centers for Yiddish. After the war. There's even more, right? You've got Jewish communities in Melbourne. You've got Jewish communities um, in Winnipeg. You know, you've got Jewish communities all over. So they, they, they look to this encyclopedia as a way to keep them all together. And so they have emissaries that go, they go to Cuba, they, you know, they go to Buenos Aires, trying to fundraise and try to bring these communities into conversation 
with one another. Um, recognizing at some level that they're maybe among the last of, of their, their kind. At the same time, they're also embarking on this project of translation. And this is where these Yiddish language volumes come out of, is that they believe that, you know, there is this inherent vo uh, value to Yiddish culture and the, 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 the works that it produced and the ideologies of sort of diasporism in some ways that it sustained and they were also infused with this very important sort of working class ethos to them. You know, they're socialists, they're Mensheviks. Um, and what they want to do with these Yiddish language projects is to try to make that history and culture sort of available to American Jews. Like they keep talking about the new community in America. Like it's 300 years old by this time period, right? But they're talking about like the old world is gone, the new world, like American Jews have to carry the mantle, right? Of Judaism forward. Of course, Israel is not a state until 48. It's tiny, you know, for a very long time period. It's Hebrew speaking, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's uh, the relationship to Yiddish is really fraught. And so they, they see what they have to do is they have to figure out a way to translate the like the most important bits of Eastern European uh, Jewish life and civilization for an American audience to make it useful. It is not received well. Uh, what's interesting, like Milton Himmelfarb, right? One of the great sort of later neocons of our, of our time. Um, he writes a review of Jewish people past and present where he says like, nice try, but we have different needs, you know? Interestingly, he becomes a literary editor of a subsequent volume, which is quite fascinating. So he's not giving up on it entirely, but it doesn't really translate over in the, the same way. And it's only kind of much later after Yiddish goes through this sort of nostalgic period that people begin, I think, examining these works and trying to figure out kind of what is to be learned from them. But there's just a period where American Jewry, I think, has to sort of plant its own stake and doesn't want to have to feel bound by sort of the, the weightiness and kind of the oppression of sort of the, the, this European Jewish inheritance that they have. Thank you for that. Are there other questions or uh, observations or comments uh, for our guest? Well, you gave an encyclopedic talk, Barry, and I think you've covered <laughs> all the bases. <laughs> I thank, thank you. And I have to go it. teach a class in five minutes. So, <laughs> uh, we very much appreciate your talk. We very well, much you. appreciate your salute to the Humanities Institute back at you. you. Loved it. Um, and I thank everybody for attending. We'll have another one of these uh, Humanities uh, uh, Summer Writing Grant presentations on March 29th, and you'll see information about that in the upcoming newsletter. Until then, I wish everybody a great afternoon. Uh, thank you all for being here. Goodbye. Thank, thank you. you. Take thank care. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. So Amy, I'm just seeing your note now. Yeah, sorry, it was fine. <laughs> what it did was I do fine. wrong? Yeah, it, we could see everything. It was fine. Yeah. Okay. What 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 shouldn't you have seen though, or what what could I have done differently? Just put it in presenter view or something. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you All go right. to slideshow and just do that, I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't so get when to you ahead no, of time, okay. I didn't notice it until yeah, yeah, it was like the third slide, when, and so yeah. When I've done that, I've lost my ability to see yeah. all of you. And I wondered if that screens. was the, yeah. I wondered if yeah. that was part of it too that you wanted to keep an eye on because it was, yeah. But don't no worries. It was it was great. So okay. yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Good, good, good. No, but I worry about this all the time you, in my okay. classes because when I put it in presenter view, I lose because then it it shows this per, like this preview view on my yeah. little monitor. Yes. Yeah. Which is what I'm looking into, and I'm also using an iPad to actually yeah for my notes. Um. So yeah. So I'll. I'll yeah, sorry about that. No worries at all. Like I said, okay. I, I thought that was probably the case that it was like a, you know, screen, like, you know, but it was, um, we could see everything fine. It was just, yeah, good, good, good. I, right. I wanted to, it's yeah, to know. just wanted to bring it, but it was, I wasn't going to push it if it wasn't, I didn't want to distract I appreciate you from it. the talk. Yeah. So yeah. I have yeah. a rule that I can't read the chat while I'm talking because yeah. I get so distracted. It's so I've like, tried to do I'm it just too. a mess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Barry, someday I want to ask you about um, yeah. the Shanghai uh, Jewish Refugees Museum. Do you, yeah, yeah, sure. I just I went there I a little bit in Shanghai it. a couple years ago, and I wondered if yeah, it's a really interesting place, and I didn't know if there was any, you know, I didn't know how language is affected in sort of the you know the Jewish yeah, community so that gets established it's, there. It's mostly German Jews yeah. who mm -hmm. go there, who take it, refuge yeah. there. So it doesn't 
factor in with with my folks uh, right, yeah. very mm-hmm. much mm-hmm. but yeah there's super interesting studies about it and yeah. it's this point of like utter fascination for people and an old friend of mine who I'm not in touch with anymore her father was one of those folks mm-hmm. so yeah she yeah. tells super fascinating stories about it it's yeah. a really interesting yeah just you know the uh, it was a highlight of going it was just a really interesting yeah absolutely yeah, while we were there. there's all yeah. these sites you know that mm-hmm. emerge for periods of time you know there's Havana there's Lisbon there's Shanghai Mm-hmm. where Jews go uh, to wait and to wait mostly to come into America, right? Because there's this crazy visa system right. where you can only come in when your visa comes up. But you have these centers. And there's some people, I think, I think Marion Kaplan at NYU is writing a book trying to look at these places in relationship to one another. Mm-hmm. I've heard her speak on pieces of it, but it'll be amazing when it all gets sort of put together, you know. Yeah. Fantastic. Cool. Thanks. Well, sorry, Thanks, I think you yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. I really am grateful afternoon. for this. Let yeah, you and I catch you. up and try to get a walk in this week. I would love it. All right. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.